thank you everybody here uh, for choosing this uh, talk uh, over the beautiful weather uh, that we have, the spring weather that we have outside on March 4th. Uh, so just a few uh, pre preparatory remarks. Uh, I wanna thank Anna for your generous introduction and, and for giving me the opportunity to present this curial talk today in order to contextualize historically and to illuminate conceptually the small exhibition of nine photographs on display at the center throughout this academic year. These images were taken by the German Jewish refugee photographer Ilse Bing, who was born in Frankfurt in 1899, while she was aboard the steamship SS Winnipeg in flight from Vichy, France in May 1941, against the backdrop of World War II and the destruction of European Jewry. This historic journey would bring her to New York City, where she would live until March 1998, or just a few weeks before her 99th birthday. And I'll be talking more about Bing's forced migration out of Vichy France and the compelling narrative of her maritime escape, along with other talented Jewish refugee photographers who fled Nazi Germany by way of Marseille with the help of the American journalist, Varian Fry, and his organization, the Emergency Rescue Committee. These photographs are housed as part of the Elsa Bing Fond at the National Gallery of Canada in Ottawa, and we are grateful to their curatorial staff, as well as to the photography collector, Dr. Michael Mattis, who serves as the administrator of the Elsa Bing estate, for giving us the permission to mount high resolution digital prints of the original gelatin silver photographs and to publicize this exhibition. A photographic star is reborn on Ilse Bing's posthumous acclaim. Looking at the number of recent photography and modern art exhibitions at major European and North American museum institutions over the past couple of years that have included her work, one cannot but conclude that Ilse Bing's star has risen once again. We are definitely not alone in recognizing the importance of her photographic practice. We might even say in line with my nautically inclined title that Ilse Bing is fighting an intense wave of recent curatorial and academic interest. As one instance of the posthumous attention that she is receiving 25 years after her passing, her photographs were featured in After Cubism from the permanent of the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art that opened September 2023 and that closes on March the 17th. So you still have time, almost two weeks, to get yourself out to San Francisco, for some of you again, to see that show. Coincidentally, the show is entitled, this is uncanny, Sea Change, Photographs from the Collection, though it does not include any of the nine photos on display upstairs. And I'll discuss further why this might be the case, given the private-public dichotomy that is applied to such work. The exhibition also includes the on-site presentation of an edited and subtitled video, and there you see a still, that consists of an informative interview with the non agenarian artist conducted by the German filmmaker Antonia Lurch, that was part of her tripartite documentary released in 1992 on German Jewish female refugee photographers active in the Weimar era. When we look to Europe, it is also important to acknowledge the most comprehensive exhibition work staged in Barcelona last year, February through May, under the auspices of the Foundation Mapre curated by Juan Vicente Alegia, which announces itself as, quote, a complete survey of the photographic production of the German photographer, Elsa Bing. And I want to put that national affiliation in scare quotes for sure. The exhibition was accompanied by an aesthetically stellar catalog that included essays by 
Aliaga, as well as art historians Benjamin H.D. Buchlow and Donna West Brett. Finally, it is an uncanny coincidence that today also marks a small photography exhibition, the opening, that includes a sampling of Bing's work in which I have played a role as part of my association with the Jewish Visual Culture Seminar year at the University of Michigan. Entitled, The Camera as Passport, The Ship of Photographers, and sponsored by both the Frankel Institute for Advanced Judaic Studies and the Center for European Studies, it showcases photographers who fled Europe on the SS Winnipeg, and it is co-curated by University of Michigan professor Deborah Dash Moore and myself. These exhibitions, plus others unmentioned, are turning and returning our attention to this fascinating Jewish-German uh, refugee photographer who was celebrated as the Queen of the Leica because of her pioneering and almost exclusive use of this lightweight and portable 35 millimeter camera, which she, which she applied successfully to the fields of photojournalist reportage and commercial photography, including fashion and advertising, making a mark for herself in popular French and American magazines throughout the 1930s, including View, Harper's Bazaar, and Vogue. Bing also appeared in avant-garde exhibitions where she rubbed shoulders with surrealist and new vision photographers. Bing's love affair with the Leica is also on display in her ingenious staging of the famous self-portrait with Leica from 1931, where the wide-eyed photographer faces and looks into a mirror while a second side view mirror captures her and her Leica in a perfect profile pose. It is a self-reflexive image that puts front and center and sideways too the idea of the camera as the mirror with the memory. It also shows Bing under the influence of the optical plays found in the work of her Bauhaus photographic mentor in Paris, Florence Henry. And here you see two examples, one from 28 that she's certainly drawing upon. This image of Bing's captures a moment of formal experimentation in her self-portrait work, even as it reflects the nurturing milieu of the Parisian art scene where this highly assimilated German-Jewish immigrant excelled as a professional photographer. One presumes that the photographic artist in these doubled portraits, self-portraits of 1931, had no idea that she would be fleeing for her life and that she would become one of the artists of the survival to apply American poet Robert Duncan's phrase only a decade later. She would be made to face and reflect upon the Jewish question, or to put it in more theoretical terms, borrowing from Alan Sekula, her interpolation as a Jewish subject by state power and institutional authorities seeking to transform her self-portrait into a mugshot in order to suit the anti-Semitic racialist agenda of Vichy France and Nazi Germany. Next section, reviewing the ups and downs of Bing's Parisian decade. In the first art monograph on Bing, Abrams, 2006, the curator Larissa Dryansky writes, like many Jew German Jews of the bourgeoisie, Bing did not seem to have grasped the full meaning of Hitler's takeover, end of quote. After all, Bing already found herself based in Paris, unlike so many of her German Jewish Weimar photographic peers at the time of the Nazis' Machtergreifung in late January 1933. Nevertheless, it did not take long for Bing to be confronted with politico-ethical issues that raised Jewish questions, such that she could not turn a blind eye to what was happening in the land of her birth. For example, in May 1933, 
the very same month of the infamous book burnings in Berlin, Le Monde Illustré, another of the French magazines that published her work frequently, ran a special story on the fate of German Jews that Bing was asked to illustrate. Unfortunately, I have not been able to locate the original article, but I have determined the images reproduced, and there are two of them. Obviously, Bing was not about to go back to Germany to shoot images of Nazi persecution of the Jews for this article. Instead, three Bing photographs were selected for inclusion with the article that depicted street scenes in the Jewish quarter that she had snapped in 1932. This generates a strange disconnect in an article about what was happening to the Jews of Germany since Hitler's rise to power. In one of the images, a group of Jewish women talk things over in front of the butcher shop. In another, a group of Jewish men, very gendered, are gathered in front of the posters written in Yiddish and French that advertise upcoming theatrical and cultural events. Dryansky comments, the pictures in themselves, however, do not say much about contemporary events. They read mainly as documents of an unusual and in a sense exotic aspect of Paris. To Bing herself, the Eastern European Jews in traditional garb who peopled the neighborhood of the Rue des Rosiers were not a familiar sight. Her images, as a result, remain at a distance, end of quote. In signaling her distance from the urban street life of the Marais, Dryansky points to the fact that even though she was an immigrant herself, Bing was a secular and highly assimilated German Jew with no real connection to these mostly Eastern European Jewish immigrants. Even if she lived in proximity to them for a time, her primary identification was as an avant-garde artist. It also should be noted that there is a scant amount of Jewish subject matter in Bing's street photographic oeuvre. In this way, she was the polar opposite of somebody like Roman Vishniak. However, we do know that Bing took an ethical stand in this same period by not allowing any of her work to be published in German magazines after 1933. Following Dryansky's account, it was not until the flashpoint of Kristallnacht on the 9th of November 1938 that Bing became deeply affected by the enormity of Nazi persecution in Germany. This event drove Bing's sister Liza to leave Germany for New York. Now, it should be recalled that Bing already visited New York City in spring 1936, where her photographs were received, well-received, in both artistic and commercial circles, and during which time she was offered a position at Life magazine, which she declined. Coincidentally, Bing took a series of dramatic photographs at sea during this first transatlantic voyage as well. She decided to return to Paris then because her partner, Conrad Wolf, was still working there as a musician. In the next year, four of her works were included in the important Museum of Modern Art exhibition, Photography, 1839 to 1937, curated by Beaumont Newhall. The contacts and the networks that she established or cemented during her successful New York trip probably saved her life because it strengthened her bonds to important art and cultural influencers, including Beaumont Newhall, the curator at the MoMA, Harper's Bazaar's editor-in-chief, Carmel Snow, who you see in the middle, and the Dutch emigre historian and journalist, Henrik von Loon. These key players would serve as her advocates in bringing Bing's plight to the attention of the Emergency Rescue Committee and enabling her and her husband to get onto Varian Fry's list only a few years later. 
Let us recall that Bing had emigrated to Paris in 1930, November of 1930, of her own volition, following the call of photography and her desire to study with the Bauhaus-trained artist, Florence Henri, who was already living there. Therefore, she was based in Paris for a full decade, and she always talked about it as the place where she felt the most alive and most at home. In her 1988 interview with Herlinda Kolbe, she states, I'm actually only rooted in Paris. When I come to Paris, I physically feel roots of myself in the pavement. I felt that from day one. I only have this physical feeling of being rooted in Paris, end of quote. Now, while it is important not to dismiss Bing's strong feelings and the effective power of her psychological rootedness, we also have to acknowledge that her Paris complex turned out to be a self-deluded fantasy because it did not take into consideration what would have given such sentiments, political meaning, and legal status even before the fall of France in 1940. In other words, this romantic idealization reads as the illusory desire of a Jewish artist in, quote, semi-exile from Germany, end of quote, to use Diana West Brett's phrase, wanting desperately to establish roots in Paris during the 1930s. But despite this feeling of being rooted in Paris, Bing never took the political path to citizenship during her decade sojourn, even though she did consider it after 1933. And we all know this dream of French belonging would shatter in mid-May 1940, when she, along with other German Jewish refugees in France, were deemed enemy aliens by the French government, and she was forced out of her beloved Paris. Deported to the internment camp in Gur, near the Spanish border in the Pyrenees, she lamented her treatment there in that same interview, using powerful imagery and harsh words. Quote, I felt like it was a concentration camp. I sat by the barbed wire. This this bondage in German, Unfreiheit, the absolute lack of freedom and degradation, end of quote. Surprisingly, Bing does not talk about extreme mental duress as a component of in Ge, in contrast to her photographic colleague, Yola Nicholas Sachs, who refers to, I have the quote there on the bottom right, to not being able to, quote, fight off a kind of confinement psychosis, or in German, Haftsuchosa. The bursting of Bing's bubble reminds one of the bitterly ironic anecdote relayed by Hannah Arendt, who was another fellow prisoner and barracks mate in Gore. The level-headed political philosopher gives the lie to the myth of somehow being at home in Paris in her classic essay, We Refugees from 1943, wherein she mocked this Jewish emigre fantasy of assimilation in and to French culture with her darkly humorous joke about the archetypical refugee, Mr. Cohn, who had fled Vienna in 1938. And here we can read this together. The German invasion forced Mr. Cohn out of that country. He arrived at a bad moment, and he never did receive a regular residence permit. Having already acquired a great skill in wishful thinking, he refused to take mere administrative measures seriously, convinced that he would spend his future life in France. Therefore, he prepared his adjustment to the French nation by identifying himself with our ancestor, Versongetorix, who was the ancestral Gallic king. I think I had better not dilate on the further adventures of Mr. Cohn. As long as Mr. Cohn can't make up his mind to be what he actually is, a Jew, nobody can foretell 
all the mad changes he will have to go through. End of quote. Now, while we might not frame the artist Bing, nor her pianist partner Wolf as parvenu types, and rather more aligned to Arendt's hidden tradition of the Jew as pariah, this does not obviate the fact that Bing shared the wishful thinking of French belonging and the romantic myth of her rootedness. With the help of Conrad Wolf, who somehow, according to Dry he, quote, managed to intervene with the camp authorities after and after many difficulties, end of quote, Bing, like Arendt, was able to leave Gur a few weeks after the capitulation of France and the establishment of the Nazi collaborating Vichy government. She was reunited with her husband on July 11th, and they wisely headed to Marseille, hoping to obtain an American visa there. Bing was extremely fortunate that her photographic metier, her successful track record, and her powerful contacts, coupled with her husband's musical accomplishments, made them very attractive candidates to the ERC, thereby landing them on Fry's list in the fall of 1940. And there you see Fry at work in his study on the right, and there a little... Uh, uh, footnote, you might say, to history, uh, an undated appointment notice where Conrad Wolf visits uh, Varian Fry in, in his office in Marseille. Next section. We have spins and optics, framing Bing as politically engaged photographer. If we look at the records of Ilse Bing and Conrad Wolf in the archives of the Emergency Rescue Committee, there is no mention of their status as Jews explicitly. This goes along with the fact that the mandate of Varian Fry and the ERC was to help artists and intellectuals who were in, quote, imminent danger rather than Jews per se. For instance, this oft reproduced publicity photo of Fry shows him surrounded by the surrealist superstars, Andre Breton, Jacqueline Breton, Max Ernst, and Andre Messon with no Jewish content regarding these refugees about to be rescued. However, the fact that the vast majority of those who were in imminent danger were Jewish artists and intellectuals should come as no surprise. What is interesting about the materials in the Bing Wolf file, including the affidavit, affidavit by Van Loon on September the 3rd, 1940, and Bing's biography especially, is the extent of the political spin and even untruths put to paper in order to make a stronger case for their coveted U.S. visas. Okay. In promising to act as their sponsor in the U.S., Van Loon's affidavit underscores the imminent danger they are facing though he does not specify exactly how this was the case. That's the image on the left. Meanwhile, Bing's biography on the right, the short biography, written either by Van Loon or by someone else at the ERC, we don't know, gets it wrong from the very first claim made in her name. Quote, having left Germany because of the Nazis, she took up residence in France where her artistic and brilliant work won her a great reputation, end of quote. We know already that Bing left Frankfurt of her own volition during the Weimar period for non-political reasons because she felt she could grow more as an emigre artist in Paris. And as she recalled in the interview with Kerbel, quote, to make things a little more concrete, I have to say that I left Germany of my own free will. Not good for the ERC. That was already in 1930, before Hitler, continues the quote, because I felt restricted there and couldn't develop, end of quote. The next part of the resume, if you can read the fine print there, plays up anti-fascist aspects of her work and insists that she has become a known enemy of the Nazi regime. And I'll read this part for you. She made no secret of her strong opposition to fascism, 
And in many instances, her photographic work showed her anti-fascist attitude. Because of her prominence as a photographer, Ilse bing Wolf's opposition to the present political regime in her country became known to the Germans, end of quote. Now, Ilse Bing was no John Hartfield, but the strategy here was clearly to make her into a political activist artist with an anti-fascist agenda in order to secure her visa, her visa, whether or not this was actually the case. Indeed, Bing is quite fortunate that she was not asked to prepare a portfolio of her work to support these politically engaged artistic claims. But even after the immigration visas were granted to them in Marseille, it was not clear sailing for Bing and Wolf. On March 28, 1941, Fry wrote to Hiram Bingham the following note. Mr. Conrad Wolf and his wife have immigration visas expiring on May the 17th. Their reservations are on a boat leaving Lisbon on May 30th. Is there anything to be done for them now? End of quote. It is likely that, and there you see him, the American vice counsel, Bingham, who worked closely with Fry and who was well known for his refugee sympathies, pulled a few strings to facilitate their departure. After all, Bing and Wolf never went to Lisbon, and they boarded the so-called ship of photographers that left Marseille bound for the Caribbean island of Martinique on May the 7th, 1941. Now, the saga of the SS Winnipeg, contextualizing the ship of photographers. What was the specific historical context for the creation of Ilse Bing's nine photographs on display at the center? In order to answer this question, we must learn more about the voyage of the SS Winnipeg and the compelling story of its photographic passengers. In his informative and invaluable chapter, The Crossings, In Escape from Vichy, The Refugee Exodus to the French Caribbean, published in 2018, French historian and our distinguished U of T colleague, Eric Jennings, coins the phrase ship of photographers in reference to the voyage of the SS Winnipeg that set sail in May 1941. Bing was one of eight photographers, seven of them Jewish refugees, on, this bo on board this overcrowded ship carrying 750 passengers. The other photographers on board were Josef Breitenbach, the Hungarian Camilla Koffler, known as Illa, the Belgian Charles Lawrence, uh, Lawrence uh, the only non-Jewish photographer, the Russian-born Frenchman Boris Lipnitsky, Yola Nicholas Sachs, who you see there, Fred Stein, you also see on the left, and Moni Tannen. Bing, Breitenbach on the right, Nicholas Sachs, Stein, and Tannen were all German Jews, and the ship included an estimated 300 refugees holding German and Austrian passports. In addition, there were approximately 75 French soldiers and officers of the French Marines on board and 120 French nationals in the cabin class, many of whom were suspected of being Nazi collaborators on a mission to infiltrate Martinique. On the night of May 26th, just two hours away from Martinique, the ship was boarded by armed Dutch soldiers who arrested the Vichy French soldiers. After all, they were at war, rerouting the ship to Port of Spain in Trinidad. All of the refugees were then taken to a camp in Trinidad where they were held for questioning. Supposedly, the accommodations there were considered luxurious in comparison with European standards. When they were finally released, Bing was able to journey to New York on the next ship to the US, the SS Evangeline, landing on June the 30th, thereby ending her arduous transatlantic ordeal. Along with Breitenbach, 
and Nicholas Sachs. And there you see two photos, one from each. Bing was only one of three photographers on board who documented the journey with the tools of their trade. One can view her Leica functioning as a navigational tool for Bing, as something that provided her with a sense of orientation amid her forced departure from Europe and on a voyage of exodus that would take her first to the Caribbean and then to the United States. The balance, symmetry, and the formal composition of the final image on board the ship attests to how she often found an ordering principle in and through her camera work. Despite any rocking motions caused by the waves, and despite forced migration throwing her life into disarray, the refugee photographer achieves a sense of balance here. Much of what we know about this trip is derived from a comprehensive article written by Fritz Neugass, a German Jewish refugee photographer himself, entitled The Saga of the SS Winnipeg. It was published in June 1951 in the American journal Modern Photography to mark the 10th anniversary of its perilous joy voyage, and I'm drawing upon it liberally here. Neugast reports how the photographers met each other on the ship this way, quote, during the, life, during the wartime lifeboat drills of the SS Winnipeg, these eight discovered each other, end of quote. In line with Neugast's statement, Bing documents the suspended lifeboats with the coast beyond them in one of the nine photographs that she printed. There's a subtle irony here in seeing that even as the photographers were being rescued from Vichy France and Nazi Germany, there was still the need for lifeboats and wartime safety drills, just in case. Bing thereby marks the ongoing precariousness of her German Jewish refugee journey in life during wartime. Neugast illustrates this article with examples from nearly all the photographers, but only one image documents the voyage, and that's it. This is Yola Nicholas Sachs's photo captioned Deck of the Winnipeg, where we see passengers and officials on the lower deck of the ship with bulky white life jackets dominating the scene. Neugast also devotes a section of his article to Bing under the heading Historian to Photographer. This is a peculiar title on the surface because there can be little doubt that the images that Bing took on the ship serve a documentary purpose and function as historical documents on one level. We can certainly see the documentarian at work in the nine shots that not only record this pivotal migratory moment in Bing's life, but are also part of the larger story and history of Jewish refugees who were forced, forced to flee Nazi Germany and who got out in the nick of time. Perhaps this German Jewish refugee's version of Henri Cartier-Bresson's decisive moment. What exactly does Neugas mean here? In this section, Neugas traces Ilse Bing's photographic beginnings and learns that the origin study can be traced to her graduate studies in the art history program at the University of Frankfurt. Quote, Ilse Bing was a student of history of art in her early years. For her research, she needed pictures, so she bought a camera. Soon the interest in photography outgrew the interest in art." End of quote. Indeed, the story goes that Bing bought a Voigtländer camera in 1928 to take pictures for her doctoral researches on the late uh, uh, 18th century architect Friedrich Gilly. Clearly, these images served a documentary and visual note-taking or record-keeping function as she worked on her dissertation, in line with Baudelaire's ideas regarding the proper non-artistic uses of photography. But can the same thing be said about the shots that she took on the SS Winnipeg? In contrast to Baudelaire and the desire for strict borders between photography and art, or between history and photography, in Neugass's case, I would argue that these images should be considered both a part of photographic history 
and a part of the history of photographic art, and especially in light of the allegorical dimensions that adhere to Bing's images. Allegorically speaking, Bing's exodus on camera. In a short text, How They Met, Josef Breitenbach, Fred Stein, and Illa, Camilla Koffler, that reflects on the proper classification of photographs that Breitenbach took on the SS Winnipeg, and that parallels the questions around the use and reception of Bing's photographs in our exhibition. The photo historian Helene Roth examines the private versus public distinction often made in regard to this type of photographic production. She points out how some photos in a body of work will be classified as artistic, as opposed to others by the same photographer that will be viewed as personal or private documents and considered as part of the historical record alone. Breitenbach's case on the SS Winnipeg is no exception. As her illustrated example, she turns to an informal and relaxed snapshot that Breitenbach took of Stein and Illa on the ship. As Roth articulates it, and there's the quote, these photographs have largely been absent from photographic analyses and have appeared only in historical publications such as Escape from Vichy, 2018, and The Unwanted, America, Auschwitz, and A Village Caught in Between, 2019. As part of a private immigration history, they were not part of the photographer's professional artistic repertoire, end of quote. And now, of course, I'm going to take issue with that. Nevertheless, it is possible to spring leaks in this analysis, or at least to make things a lot choppier by looking at Breitenbach's image entitled Ocean, hitherto unpublished in any history book, but that we have included in the Camera as Passport exhibition for its aesthetic as well as its historical value. With no horizon lines in sight, this is a lyrical and almost abstract composition taken in the, middle, in the middle of the ocean that unmoors the spectator and that forces them to lose their bearings or to feel lost. I would argue that this image offers the perfect embodiment of what it means for somebody to feel as if they are at sea, also in the figurative sense of being confused or being unable to decide what to do. It captures the mood of a displaced person seeking to find their bearings anew. Now, Bing's case complements Breitenbach in that two images are found in Professor Jennings' book as well. Nevertheless, let us not forget that Bing printed, signed, and mounted the nine images that made their way to the National Gallery's collection with great care and in a fairly large format during the 1950s. This aestheticizing treatment with no difference accorded to her artistic signature in any of these prints leads us to believe that she thought that they should be deemed to be part of her, quote, professional artistic repertoire, end of quote, too. Moreover, I would argue that there is a pronounced figural or even allegorical aspect to Bing's nine images that take them out of the space of documentary fact and into the realm of symbolic meaning where they function as narrative tropes for Jewish exile writ large. This brings them into communication with a biblical figure that goes back to the exodus of the Israelites from the land of Egypt and even earlier to the book of Genesis. In other words, I am arguing that this biblical reference, which is in the ancestral DNA of Jewish cultural memory, exists in the optical unconscious of Bing's German Jewish refugee images on the SS Winnipeg. And this is what lends these images a symbolic power and a poignancy beyond merely documentary status. Indeed, I would argue further 
that this becomes one of the ways in which Bing's statement in her interview with Kobel regarding the importance of her Jüdische Herkunft, her Jewish ancestry, is actualized in her photography. Quote, there, there is something in us that goes far back, much further than the last three generations. I feel like I come from ancestors that go back thousands of years, end of quote. As the Jewish refugees in one of Bing's images in cataloged as dockyard, look back at what they are leaving behind in Marseille in, and in Europe in general, Eric Jennings interprets this, this image as, quote, four adult passengers seem to bid farewell to Europe, end of quote. And as the anxious little boy looks Bing in the eye of her like a camera, we flash back to other journeys that, to quote Bing again, go back thousands of years and to the original biblical injunction of lech lecha and the need to take leave of thy father's and mother's house. In this way, Bing is guided by the exilic travels and travails of her ancestors who were faced with the necessity of forced migrations and diasporic itineraries resonating with her own Exodus story, fleeing from the persecution of Vichy France and Nazi Germany aboard the SS Winnipeg in 1941, and finding freedom upon her arrival in a safe harbor, namely the port of New York. Next, more levity. A photography of and for the dogs, encountering the Irish wolfhound on board. The third and fourth images in the series feature the presence of an Irish wolfhound on the upper deck in front of the ship's life boy and chained to the railing shot from two slightly different vantage points and in two different formats. In the portrait mode example, the dog is in the center of the action standing in front of the life boy. In the landscape, the dog lies on the ground so that we don't see its legs but this wider view allows for a lookout to the water and down to the ship's lower deck. One clearly notices the luggage tag around the animal's neck in both images. If one didn't know anything about Bing's life or her other work, these two animal photos would read as really a chance for some novel subject matter during the long journey. But any student of Bing's photographic output and her biography knows the central role that dogs played for her as objects of study and affection, both personally and professionally. Mm -hmm. Given what she had gone through in Gur the prior year, it is not far-fetched to think of her identifying with and having felt compassion for this chained-up dog as a, feller, fella, as a fellow creature in bondage for the formerly interred Bing. It is also telling that in her interview with Lurch, when she recounts her degrading experience in the internment camp, she invokes in one and the same breath two lost love objects, her man and man's best friend. She said, you didn't even know where your husband was. You didn't even know where your dog was. But even though the dog on the ship's deck was chained to the railing next to the life boy, it is, or it was, paradoxically sailing toward freedom in the new world, just like Bing, hence the luggage tag. In this way, the Irish wolfhound is inextricably tied to her in their shared journey of departure and exodus. Now, we must recall that Bing was not only an avid dog lover, but that she also became a dog groomer in New York, at a later point in her life, which Professor Buchlow views as somewhat demeaning for her. He recalls that, quote, she was forced to earn her living as a dog groomer for the Manhattan middle class, end of quote. One gathers here that there was a strong sense of projection and identification between Bing and a number of photogenic dogs over the course of her career, beginning with her famous Pomery champagne advertisement in 1933 uh, to celebrate the company's 100th anniversary, 
Here, the cutesy ad campaign uses the Pomeranian breed as the mascot for the champagne. Not unlike Elliot Erwitt, her schnauzer staccato later became the protagonist for many humorous photographs during her American period in the 50s, whether causing mischief with the bathroom toilet paper, eating a shoelace, or being very cute and attentive while listening to Conrad playing the piano. And her dogs also appear in portraits in the same period, where she foregrounds Shuby in 1948 on the left, and Staccato, 1957, on the right, at the same time that she turns herself into a shadow, thereby emptying out her own subjectivity in the process. These two images are analyzed closely by Buchlow in his October essay, and they become significant for his arguments. For instance, Buchlow reads Bing's self-portrait with staccato taken with a Roloflex camera, which he started using after 1950, in terms of a post-war emptying out of the subject of portraiture in photography, emblematic of an overarching loss of confidence in the self after the Holocaust and Hiroshima, and in stark contrast to where her career began in the playful and assertive self-portrait with Leica from 1931. Buchlo states, and there's the quote, to have a dog figure as the sitter of portraiture, accompanied by the mere shadow of the artist, might seem to cite a cruel colloquial diagnosis suggesting that somebody, or perhaps a whole culture, had gone to the dogs, end of quote. Buchlo underscores the German version of this pejorative expression in a footnote below. Auf den Hunden gekommen. And he defines it as, quote, referring to a person's diminished desire to engage any longer with the challenges of action, social interaction, or human subjects, end of quote. All right, now my pivotal theoretical section, and then a coda, so bear with me. A photographic star has been reborn, but is it a Jewish star? Aside from his appropriate focus on Bing's, shall we say, dogmatic stance in Ilse Bing, a Frankfurt school photographer in Paris and New York, there is another more problematic aspect of Buchlo's substantial essay that requires further consideration. I began this lecture with a review of the resurgence of interest in Bing's work and Buchlo's essay in the canonical art journal October published in the second half of a double issue, there you see it, in the summer of, of 2020, that he edited on the life and work of seven female photographers in Weimar, Germany, forced into exile, is certainly a key aspect of this renewed interest in Bing in scholarly circles. It is important to recognize, and if you read down the list, you'll see that in this issue, to remember that six of the seven photographers were Jewish women, who were forced into exile after uh, the rise of Hitler and the Nazis, and with the imposition of state-sanctioned anti-Semitism. The list also includes Ellen Auerbach, Greta Stern, Lati Jacobi, Annie Fischer, and Giselle Freund. The only exception is Germaine Crow. In his introduction, Photography's Exiles, that you see with the first green arrow up there, Buchlo notes the fact of forced migration by pairing the racial ethnic difference, Jewish, with the political, socialist, or anarchist as root cause causes. And he states, but what equally motivated us to assemble this group of essays was an even more astonishing absence of critical reflection regarding the conditions of exile shared by the majority of these Jewish female photographers, all of whom had to flee Nazi Germany because they were Jewish, socialist, or anarchist avant-garde figures, end of quote. But when we read Buchlo's essay, the word Jewish appears only two times, and these instances are tangential to his argument. He mentions in a footnote that one of Bing's first commissions in architectural photography was for the Bujheim 
in Frankfurt in 1930 on account of her friend, the Dutch architect, Mart Stam. Quote, donated by the Jewish philanthropists, Henry and Emma Budge, the Budgeheim was a large scale home for Frankfurt's elderly population, explicitly supporting joint Jewish Christian community housing, end of quote. It is later in the essay, however, that the Jewish question enters into Buchlo's analysis of Elsa Bing, and this passage deserves closer interrogation. Interestingly, this happens in the analysis of a photo from 1931 that stages another of Bing's many encounters with the Eiffel Tower, and that does so with a keen new vision awareness of its abstract geometry. Amid a description of this French national icon, the archetypical Jewish symbol of the Mogan David enters as a type of return of the repressed in the following reading of the implied reception history of Bing's work by this Harvard University art historian. And here's the quote that we are going to analyze. By a mere act of Bing's projective seeing, the formation of a large eight-pointed metal star appears in the center of the photograph. While her star, suggestively reminiscent as it might be, is distinctly not identical with the six-pointed star of David, the emblem of her religion, the centrality of its position in the image, as well as the impact of its seemingly accidental formation, force the spectator to contemplate its sudden appearance either as a secular apotropaic star of redemption or as an omen of imminent sociopolitical catastrophe and persecution, end of quote. One notes the extremely evocative, even provocative figural language at work in Buchlo's complex and somewhat contradictory passage. First of all, it is quite peculiar that, that Buchlo associates Bing with the emblem of her religion, given that Bing did not affiliate with the Jewish religion at all. In fact, she finds herself much more comfortable using the term Rasse in relation and in reference to her Jewishness than religion. After all, she begins the interview with Kobel with the following request, which is offered as a type of disclaimer. Fragen Sie mich nicht nach der jüdischen Religion. Uh, don't ask me about Jewish religion. And then she goes on to say, Ich habe von dem Judentum nicht viel mitbekommen außer der Rasse. I didn't get much from Judaism other than race. Meanwhile, in another interview, Bing displaces calling her calling from the Jewishly religious to a more secular register in a substitution that converts the medium of photography into the God that has chosen her. I did not choose photography. It was photography that chose me. In his retrospective reading, Buchlo seems to be saying that the post-Holocaust spectator of Bing's Eiffel Tower is afforded two possible interpretations when confronted with the appearance or apparition of this star. In the first instance, Buchlo clearly is channeling and encoding the founder of the Frankfurter Jewish Lehrhaus, Franz Rosenzweig, as the author of Star of Redemption what is considered to be the most important Jewish theological treatise of the 20th century. At the very same time, he insists that Bing's shooting of the star is a secular act. Yet, as you see, the word secular is followed after a separating comma by apotropaic, which is a word that is always associated with magic and thus never of a discourse of enlightenment. Unfortunately, the apotropaic turns apocalyptic in the ominously written last part of the sentence. And here we get the sense that Buchlo is thinking ahead to the Nazi decree and enforcement of the regulation that Jewish stars 
had to be affixed to the clothes of every inhabitant in the Jewish ghettos and camps when he speaks of, quote, an omen of imminent socio-political catastrophe and persecution, end of quote. The last part of Buchlo's passage therefore invokes both pernicious state uh, uh, sanctioned anti-Semitism, persecution, and the Shoah, of course, often referred to as, quote, the catastrophe. Now, one has to wonder if the projective seeing with its prophetic overtones is to be attributed to Bing or to Buchlo himself. Biographically speaking, let us recall that the renowned German-American art historian was born in Cologne in November 1941. Is this merely a case of interpretive projection on Buchlo's part? But then, but what then is the source of this desire that drives him to convert and to recast a large eight-pointed metallic star into a six-pointed star of David? To find here an optical unconscious at work in Benjamin's sense of the term that subjects Ilse Bing to its symbolically Jewish demands. Might Buchlo's text be viewed as an overreading and an overreaching for the stars in, able to, in order to enable him thereby to catch a falling or fallen Jewish star? If such is the case, then this passage constitutes nothing more than an act of reparative reading on Buchlo's part, and one that shoots for redemption as he attempts to cope with and to work through his own traumas and guilt about the Shoah to allow him to overcome the past in what Germans call Begangenheitsbewältigung, but rather than enlist, or as he states, force the spectator into this pursuit, it would have been more of an act of resistance on Buchlo's part simply to have pointed or marvel at this suggestive figure in terms of the entrance of the uncanny into everyday life and to have left things at, to have left the interpretation of Ilse Bing at that. Coda, Exodus instead of exit. Ilse Bing does not require misshapen Jewish stars for her photographic journey from Frankfurt to Paris to New York to matter or to qualify as one undertaken by a German Jewish refugee who underwent first voluntary and then forced migration, who was a victim and survivor of anti-Semitic persecution before and during Nazi collaborating BC France, and who reflected upon her internment in Gour as bondage, as the absolute lack of freedom and degradation. As we have seen in this presentation, Ilse Bing responded to the good and bad times of her life via the lens of her portable cameras. These photographic instruments helped her immensely in order to navigate her being in semi-exile in Paris, her being in exile in New York, and being at sea and in transit during a transatlantic voyage that she commemorated with nine printed photos that tapped into the biblical figure of departure and exodus. In this way, the ironically nicknamed Queen of the Laika followed in the footsteps of countless Jewish diasporic journeys, moving her out of bondage and toward the promise of liberation and more life. Or to borrow from the Polish Jewish Murano philosopher, Agata Bielik Ropsen, that moved her out of the kingdom of the death-dealing sovereignty into a new life. Thank you.